Hello, Dominic Herbst here with Restoring Relationships. And our topic today is devil-minded or God-hearted. You can't have both. Which one are you? Well, let's walk through the truth of God's word. We're not going to subject ourselves to any opinions here of our minds. That's where the imaginations come from that exalt themselves against the living God. So let's begin with 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, this is the prophet, and he was talking about Saul who had disobeyed God, and now God's anointing was going to be taken from Saul and given to another, and that would be King David, the shepherd boy, and he was a man after God's own heart. So here we see that do not look at the countenance of the man on the outside or the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, and the Lord looks at the heart. Don't lose sight of that, because that is the premise by which we will be properly led by the wisdom of God. But the heart can also become darkened. So if God does not look upon the outward appearance as man does, and he looks at the heart, that is the measure of who we are in Christ, the condition of your heart and my heart. In 1 Samuel 13, uh, 14, but now your kingdom shall not continue. God is rebuking Saul. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. God can take at any point. If we have not been faithful in little, we will not be faithful in much. But Paul was, or Saul, King Saul was given much, and he was not faithful, and the kingdom was ripped from his hands. So we can be replaced. God doesn't need us. He wants us. He wants to use us, and it's up to you and I if we're going to walk in harmony, in step, in the congruence of his perfect word and his perfect will, and they're never in contrast to each other. God's word is never in contradiction to his will, nor is his will in contradiction to his word. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You've heard me speak this verse, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, written in the epistle to the church at Corinth about strongholds. And it says that we, he will, the Lord will, not you and I, cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Notice, knowledge is in the mind of the soul, and the thoughts are in the mind of the soul. So we know these are the places that can rise up above God and be, and be uh, contrary to him and be in rebellion against him. So be careful because the battle against the enemy is in your mind. It's in my mind. And if you think you've got a clear mind and you see it clearly, that's when you don't. It is never safe to say that I got it. I see it. The enemy's not blinding me. As soon as you say that, that's blindness right there because that's a lie. The enemy is so much more powerful than your fallen and, and your mind of flesh. The mind is not regenerated, folks. That's why, and the enemy has way too much access to it. You might say, well, wait, I'm a new creation. Yes, in your spirit. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are his children. So the mind of the soul is not where we communicate with God. You know, I, I questioned this years ago, and I thought, wait, I think about you, God, and I talk to you, and I'm, my mind is involved. That's not where my communion is, though. I can think about him. I can talk to him out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But the communion is in the spirit. His spirit, Romans 8, 16, bears witness that I am his child only in my human spirit. That's the only part regenerated. That's what God sees when he looks at you and I if we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ and we've been cleansed by his blood and we repented from our sin. He sees the regenerated spirit in us and he has communion with us there and his still small voice speaks to us there, not to our mind. If he was speaking to our mind, it would come through our ears, We'd, cut, we'd see sight, uh, you know, we'd be using the five senses. So the mind is the place where the enemy is bombarding us. 
but he's coming off as he's got something, something good for us. And he's not revealing that he's there and that he's tapping on your mind and he's massaging your mind with his vile, evil thoughts and his imaginations. So in Romans 8, 16, remember that verse, his spirit bears witness with your spirit, my spirit, that we are his children. Take a look at this verse, Romans 1, 21. Because although they knew God, notice this, it starts off, they knew God. These are people that know God. They did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. Their thoughts became futile. Why? They knew God, but they didn't glorify God. In other words, they were uh, saying, oh yeah, I know God, but they were not living as if God was sovereign and his lordship was over their lives. And so they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Wow. This proves and demonstrates that because their thoughts were not submitted under the spirit, that their thoughts were operating and preeminent in the functioning of what they were doing, what they were saying, what they were contriving in their lives, in their work, in their careers, in their ministries, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So when the mind is darkened, even with someone who knows of God will speak about God, the heart can also become darkened by that shroud that the enemy throws over the mind. We have to be very, very careful. And we'll, we find ourselves operating in a way that we're not living as if God is ordering our steps. We're actually in contradiction to what he has for us. And we are looking at our own lives for the purpose of uh, coming against him. So when you are operating in the flesh and then you resort to mind strength, that is where the enemy holds the believer captive right there. Do not Try to draw strength of who you think you are, even who you think you are in God, from your mind. Don't try to do it. It's a setup by the enemy. So uh, that there is nothing that can be trusted due to the enemy's access to our minds. We are held captive by blindness, by lies and deception, and by fear and confusion. We are totally held captive. We think we got it. We think we know what we're doing, but we do not. That is where the imaginations come from. Remember the stronghold verse in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. Casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself against God, meaning it's a rebellion against God, the thoughts in our minds. And bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We have to take our thoughts captive in the name of Jesus Christ that are coming against God. But here's the problem. Some of your thoughts you think are okay, good, and in congruence with truth, but they're not from God. Be careful, because if they're not coming from God, no matter how good they appear or how right in your mind they appear, they're not going to be right. You know, this. remember when Israel was always in trouble throughout the Old Testament? Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. We got that today. In all of this liberal thinking, everybody does what they think is right, and you got a whole bunch of people that think they're right, and they're all wrong. Each one is individually wrong, and they are totally corporately wrong. But because their foolish minds have been darkened, their hearts, their foolish hearts have been darkened as well. So in the imaginations that are injected into our thoughts, that we because we are not aware of the devices and the tactics of the enemy, that is why men are at their weakest when they attempt to reason truth. Oh my, how we love to hear the theologians talk about the truth and what this means in the scripture and what that means. I'll tell you folks, I get a little bit nauseated when I hear these theological discussions and I'll tell you why. I have never found anyone testify that they've come to Christ as a result of listening to a theological discussion. Were they awakened in an area they needed to look at? Yes. But sometimes we put so much emphasis on theology, we fail the simplicity of the truth in obedience to God, in surrendering to him, and in trusting in him in all for all of our purposes, even if we don't understand what he is doing in our lives. And if we don't even understand what he's going to do in the next step that I take, Aren't we okay not having all what we think might be the answers in theology? This is why so many seminaries that prepare our pastors 
okay, and our leaders and our missionaries for uh, ministry are called cemeteries. Seminaries actually are being called cemeteries because they're speaking more about that which is not of the life of Christ in us, but more about the death of mindless discussion. Again, in the minds, the minds coming together in theology. Be careful. Yes, we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is the truth of the word. And it doesn't mean theology doesn't have a place, but when it becomes the highest place and the God himself is second to theology, it is time to throw out the theology. Now, in John 8, 44, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and he said, you are of your father, the devil. Here they were the religious leaders, but they were serving the devil as their father, as if he was the governing authority in their lives. You know why? They were coming from foolish, darkened thoughts or minds and a foolish, darkened heart, which means they had no light in them whatsoever, not a bit. There was nothing but darkness in their spirit, in their soul, in their mind, in their hearts, all darkness. They had nothing to offer, yet they were, uh, uh, they were leading the people. How sad, how painful it had to be when all this is revealed. Because there is no truth in him, meaning of the devil. You're of your father, the devil. He speaks a lie when he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So when we try to reason everything that we believe God is doing for us, through us, in us, we will reason ourselves right out of trusting him, right out of obeying him, and we will not surrender to him. Why? Because our mind now is preeminent. And you know what enters into every human being that is operating through the darkness of their mind? Pride. Pride. Pride caused the fall of the greatest creature. Lucifer, star of the morning, he shielded the throne of God, the closest position to the Godhead in shielding the throne. And he's, there was found pride in him where he said in Isaiah 14, I will five times all imaginations that he could rise up against the creator God and he could usurp and rise above the throne of God and the stars of God and come against him. Oh, how pride blinds even this creature, uh, Lucifer, who became Satan when he was cast out of heaven. So think of this. If we, reasoning in our minds because becomes the enemy against God and all that he has for us, all. God is not in our minds of reason. In Isaiah 55, 8, and 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. He's speaking here. The Lord God, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Verse 9, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, and you can't measure that distance, Nobody can. Above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. As far as the heavens are above the earth, are my ways above your ways, for so are my thoughts above your thoughts. It can't get any clearer than that. If you, When you are surrendered to God, when he has regenerated your spirit, what will happen at that point is all of the anointings will come through your human spirit of his wisdom, and he will show you things that you could never have imagined because they came from on high, from the infinite truth and the infinite um, wisdom of God. So the, uh, in James 3.13, it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. We're going to see two kinds of wisdom right here. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, even if you're a believer, do not boast and lie against the truth. Though this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. This is not godly wisdom. This is earthly, sensual, dark. This is uh, sinful, demonic. Look, it's 
even says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So the sensual wisdom of the earth, of the mind, is demonic, meaning the spirits are in control of that type of wisdom. Now, when you're dealing with people in headship positions, when you're dealing with nation against nation, when you're dealing within a nation, party against party, and you know that there is no uh, intention to be submitted and to trust the spirit of the living God, there is no value in whatever is produced out of the heart, the dark heart of that individual. It's not personal. This is not an indictment of the individual. It's the reality of the fact that the truth is not in them. They can even speak the truth, even when they lie and think it's the truth. Why? Their foolish minds, their foolish hearts have been darkened because they, uh, they uh, claim that they know God, but they do not worship, nor do they submit to God. Therefore, they have nothing to offer you or I. If you have a counselor, even if they claim Christ, but they are not submitted to the Christ, they are not presenting you the truth of the word, which they can't go wrong there, and they are not leading you in that truth, walking you in it, there is no value for the awakening of you because they are a blind guide and you are following a blind guide. Be careful. What you're looking for in the counselor is not their foolish and darkened mind. It is the heart of truth where they present under the anointing the truth of the word. And what God has revealed through his heavenly wisdom, as we just read in James 3. So make sure you take a look at that so that you can test the spirits of the wisdom that are being given to you. This is serious. You want to sit under the wisdom of what of a person that they themselves have not been set free by the living God and are blind from the truth? and therefore cannot in any way awaken you or I to that truth if they're blind in it. They can't lead you to a place they themselves have never gone. Be careful. That's how subtle and easy it is to fall into the hands of these counselors that do not claim Christ as sovereign in what they do. You can have a good talk. You can learn a little bit about your affliction. You can learn a little bit more about yourself and why you operate or act the way yet that you do. That is no different than being diagnosed with cancer. And it's a good thing to know if you have it. It's not a good thing to have it. It's a good thing to know that you have the cancer in your physical body. But that that person says, I know where it's at. I know where it's isolated. I know what it's doing to you. I know what it's taking from you. I know what the treatments are. But you know what? I have no way or no uh, ability to help you heal. I'm sorry, I don't. So you'll have to go to someone else. See, we not only want to know what's wrong with us, we want to know that we have someone who will walk us to a place where we can be healed by a physician. In the physical body, a physician may be of this earth, but in the spiritual body and in the soul, we need the great physician, the Christ. So be very careful. And now I close from Romans 8, 5, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, Holy Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Cease all forms of intellectual reasoning. Stop it. Well, wait, can I reason like a math problem? Of course you can. We are talking about reasoning in the realm of the Spirit. If you're going to reason math problems, you're going to go to the mathematicians who know and understand math. When we're in the spiritual realm, but that has nothing to do with your eternal destination. So we're talking about the most important type of reasoning. So therefore, you go to those who have surrendered to the Christ in the full submission to him, where they are in obedience to him and they trust him. It sets you up to be devil-minded deceived, confused, and trusting in your flesh if 
You are constantly trying to reason who you are in Christ through your mind. This happens also in all of our um, marital counseling and our interpersonal counseling. People are constantly trying to do an assessment of their loved one. Then they reason it in their mind. Then they come up with these tactics. Here's the thing. Even if the tactics seem like they make sense, they're not going to do anything to draw the heart of that person back. Only Christ can do that. And then this is where we say, you don't want that person's heart drawn back to you without going through him. So if you two are on the horizontal plane and there's already a, a, a big wedge between you, you want them to be drawn back to you. So you selfishly say, God, bring them back to me. God's saying, no, 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 you don't want that, my child. I want you to pray and intercede sacrificially to bring them back to me. Why? Their eternal destination could be at risk. Now, if they're a believer, maybe that's not at risk, but their destiny and what God has for them is at risk. If you pray to bring them back to Christ, the best chance that they come back to you is through him. And if they come back to you without going through him, it's probably not going to be sustained or last. Why? Because they haven't been delivered, set free, or cleansed and purified from the very thing that separated them from you in the first place. Just use your mind of logic. Yeah, yeah. There is a logic in our minds. Now, it won't save us, okay? It won't transform us. But it'll help you realize, yeah, that doesn't make sense. So surrender your heart fully to God today. Let his spirit pierce the darkness that blinds your minds. Obey his word in love. Why? He said, if you love me, Jesus said, you will obey me. Trust in him with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Trust with your heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, God said. I look at the heart. Where I look, he wants you and I to look. Let's close in prayer, Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, we command all imaginations in our mind that we have thought were okay. All the things that we thought that were going to take us uh, to places that we would not normally have gone, we don't want to go there. Lord, we want to first always submit ourselves, therefore, unto you, God. We want to resist the devil that he will flee from us. We want to surrender all of our inclinations and all of our desires of what we want for ourselves and those we love to you, Lord. We do not want our own imaginations. We want them bound, and we want to rebuke them in the name of Jesus Christ and cast them out. And we want to surrender ourselves fully and completely to you, and, and that we do not trust in anything of our mind, of our flesh, anything that resists against your spirit, oh God. So whatever, whoever that loved one is that you're struggling with, whatever that serious situation that you may be having, that you're facing right now, God is saying, just submit to me, ask me, ask me to show you what I have been prepared to show you for some time. And listen, if you don't hear me, keep listening and keep holding fast, and you will hear my still small voice, he's saying, and, and that's in accordance with his word, and when he begins to speak to you, obey him. Do not question, obey him. In the name of Jesus Christ, we commit all of these uh, uh, areas of obedience to you, God, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank, Thank you for being with us, and we'll see you next week.